having at all. <laughs> Just so they, they've started the car. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for the Theatre of the Absurd, uh, I don't know, panel? I guess so. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Mike Cool, Richard Hope, David Lerner, Cindy Aldrin, and Jonathan Petheridge. Sharing the entire smooth operation, the one and only, the delightful, the delicious, Kevin John Davies. Thank you very much. Where are we all? Hello? I've got the purple one. <laughs> so, here we have, working from the far end, Mike Kill. Resident Vogon of this parish, uh, and also came and played Mr. Prosser in the illustrated Hitchhiker's book. The big, anyone got the big silver book? Yeah, yeah, there he was in there. So, Mike, I've, I've employed you several times as a Vogon. And the making of. 30 years in love, a From the rainbow version is where we first met. And I encased your head in green latex as, as mask maker. <laughs> and then Cindy Oswin. Now, Cindy, you had the unusual job, which you shared with uh, Maya, of playing Peter Jones's role, which you were the narrator of the very first stage version at That's the right. ICA in 1979. What can you remember about that? Well, I, uh, I turned up at the ICA to talk to Ken Campbell because I was applying to be his assistant director, applying to the Arts Council, and I had a bunch of forms for him to fill in. And uh, he was casting, and he just said, right, I've got a part here. I, you're it. And that's <laughs> how I uh, came to be the second half of the book, which, you know, was tremendously long, as you all know. And we had to learn it. And next to you is Richard Hope, who was Ford Prefect. <laughs> now, Richard, Ford Prefect, had, when you took that role at the ICA, had you heard the radio version? Uh, no. No? no? So it was all fresh? It was all fresh. It was sort of, and at the time, everybody thought, uh, nobody had heard of this phenomenon at all. Um, uh, Kenner had read it. I think because he was friends with Douglas, but at that time, nobody knew anything about it. And were you already, you were already part of Ken's troop? I was part of his team, I think, that, yes, from the, uh, <laughs> the warp, and I did the third policeman, and the end is nigh, and yeah, there were a few there, as well as this one. Yeah, yeah, so he sort of, he got you in if he thought he could um, frighten you. <laughs> <laughs> I remember you guys because I was very lucky to be in the audience, which, you know, there were people banging at the doors trying to get into the ICA. You know, those who had heard it on the radio, they knew, and they knew something hot was happening. Simon Jones himself tried to get in, and he kept saying, but I'm Arthur Dent, and they looked at him as if he was mad. Yeah, and I'm the Queen of Sheep. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so... Uh, one moment I remember was the audience was on this hovercraft, so the audience would be turned around by hefty guys on the corners moving. It's like a boxing ring affair. We'll have some pictures you'll be able to see. And um, it was just ordinary chairs on this sort of boxing ring with hover pads underneath. And we came towards you, and a scene that was played with you in the airlock, with you and Arthur, Chris Langham, Yeah. Um, you uh, took it in turns to put your wires on. Yeah, because um, it was very expensive to fly people up in, in space. And Ken, we thought, how do we do it? And Ken said, oh, I know, I've seen um, aerial work from actors uh, and trapeze artists. And so, so they said, well, what do we do? He said, no, you put them on in front of the audience. So we had to put these harnesses on and we used the towel 
to protect ourselves. <laughs> <It was good. laughs> and then we took it in turns to wipe, it was just a pulley system, really, and to put people across the top of the audience. Right. And then we carried on talking until we'd had enough, and then pulled one back, and then the other one got on. They said, we used to go, what's it like out there? And so people in the audience would, they would start speaking. But it was, it was quite a phenomenon. It was wonderful. Yeah. And uh, uh, the whole play began in the cafeteria of the ICA, where people were buying these steaming sort of cocktails that were meant to be gargle, gargle blasters. blasters. In yes. test tubes, as I remember. Yeah. They were steaming. Blue. Yeah. 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 And, um, and then uh, the Ken, play began yeah, in, no, Ken said, in the foyer. Yeah, no, Ken, no good idea here. We'll <laughs> get, we're going to blow up the lobby. <laughs> <laughs> and so I want lots of smoke in the lobby. And that will be the signal for the audience to go into the auditorium. <laughs> and they'll get a pangalactic gargle blaster, which you stood there with a tray of these things. So people were quite inebriated by the time they got onto this <laughs> Um And then I said, so what do I do? He said, oh, Ford Prefect. And he talked with Douglas Haddon and said, you just have to smile all the time, like you do. But when they look away, look as though you're going to bite them. <laughs> Until they look There's back. a picture behind, there we oh, go. Oh, right, well, there you go. There's yeah, Chris, Chris, Chris Langham on the left, and uh, yeah. there's Richard... So it was, all, it was very instant theatre, so, um, and you had, to be, you had to be up and running. You see, these photographs have just come to light this week. I've not seen many of these pictures before, and I'm an archivist of picture. Oh, right, right. So it was fantastic that, that um, John found all these pictures. Um, through you, I gather. Yeah, the photographer there was a chap called Roger Borton. He lives in France now, but he, he did photograph a lot of Ken's And, then there's, and I got them through Mitch Davis, who's, who's here. He's in the audience. Is Mitch yeah. here? At the back, back. Yes, being quiet. Who was safe for people, Brooks? Give us a wave. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One half, one half of safe for people, Brooks. Yeah. For indeed, we had a pantomime of safe for, didn't we? Yeah. Well, and Ken didn't. He used to say to Mitch, <laughs> or to Stephen Davis, who played the other half of safe make it difficult for Mitch. <laughs> <laughs> And so, he, he, and I heard it, I heard Ken say things like, as you're going up the ramp, uh, Mitch, try and get up the ramp. And then he'd say, Stephen, as Mitch is trying to go up the ramp, don't want to go up the ramp. <laughs> and so the beginning of this scene, when they started talking, it was for real. They were trying to go up. And they, it was, well, well, the version I saw, on yeah. the night I saw it, they fell over. Yeah, and I, yeah. <laughs> And I don't know whether that was deliberate. No, no, I caught them a few times. Yeah. You never get away with that now. And there's Trillian at the back there, which is Sue Jones Davis. Yeah. Oh, my God. Oh, ah, Cindy. there's Cindy on the right, Maya on the left. Now, that's what happened out in the foyer. When the Earth was then about to explode, the two space girls come out and invite us to be rescued from the destruction of the Earth. And we all went into the theatre, the audience all filed in with you, you two, like, sort of space, you know, hostesses. Well, you, you really, yes, it was necessary to actually guide people because they had had the pangalactic gargle blasters. <laughs> they had been told the Earth was about. Look at that. Place. You've got a great picture here. And um, they were confused. And there was piles of smoke coming out of the auditorium. So we helped everyone up onto the uh, hovercraft up rather rickety staircase. Masses of smoke. Big bang from a maroon. You know, the poor things were roughly disorientated. And then it rose into the air and did a 360-degree turn. <laughs> There was smoke and sound effects and lighting flashing, and it was amazing. Yeah, so anyway. all, all the scenes happened around the edge of the building. And, yeah, uh, the sets were built in a circle, weren't they? Yeah, yeah. so you yeah. didn't know quite... And then it all went black as you went on your little hovercraft journey. <laughs> while we hurriedly changed the sets or whatever and jumped up on these platforms. Yeah. Yeah. So there's there's Ken with his dog down the front there. Yeah, there's Werner there, yeah. And I think we were rehearsing Vogon poetry torture. <laughs> <laughs> Up here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It did give an extraordinary uh, illusion of space because the ICA theatre is not that big. And just to be whizzed around every few minutes was extraordinary. And we were on it all the time. And it never failed to amaze me mm. what Ken had done with the space. It's astonishing. Well, we'll carry on. The pictures will carry on. But... I've that got one, the, of, one I, other tale oh. that, that, that is quite interesting. Is no money for this project, no, <laughs> no, no wages, 
just people who want to be in it. <laughs> and, and he said, you will get an evening meal. <laughs> which you get, all the money has gone on the hovercraft. <laughs> Well, we will we'll come back to uh, talking about Ken in a little while. I'm going to skip on because that was the very first stage adaptation of Hitchhiker, very soon after the original um, seven episodes of the radio. Um, but then the next version was at Theatre Cluid, and so I'd like to introduce Jonathan Petherbridge. <laughs> Now, Jonathan, you took all six episodes and you performed, you changed it into a theatre piece in your own way. Can you tell us about that really early version of the Theatre Cluid version? Yeah, it was a mistake, really. Poster? <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, wow. I was a really, really young um, stage manager director and um, they wanted some work in the very small studio at, at Cluid, very, very small, beautiful black box. And I and um, Martin Harris were going to do a, um, uh, a, a season of War of the Worlds and Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy in promenade with dividing boxes, which we thought was a terrifically good idea. Then Martin got cold feet, and then the administrator decided Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy was very popular, and we should go into the main stage. So suddenly, it was thrust upon me that to, make, to, to, to create an adaptation for Proscenium Arch. And as you're saying, it, the, it's a very, very inspiring piece. It has a lot of space within it. That's not a pun. There's a lot of, there's a lot, there's a, there's a, there's a lot of gaps for, for, for invention and stuff. And like you, know, like you um, I mean, I, one I remember is the, the moment when, I mean, you, you start, we start with a doll's house and an actor and a, a model, a bulldozer. And the, the voices of, of, of the vocals. It was a model like a Tonka toy bulldozer, yeah, exactly. but it was the most, you know, the fantastic sound effect of a real bulldozer. Yeah, but it was a bit, The it, juxtaposition was hilarious. It's extreme, extremely poor theatre, if you like, in, in, in Brechtian terms. And then we, we went to a huge uh, machine in the auditorium that blew smoke and, and stuff onto the audience. And then, um, and, and then the, we cut to them dangling in space without towels to protect themselves. <laughs> I'm afraid that you're similar to Ken's version. Um, there was another moment in it where it went from on stage uh, with Zaphod and, and, Mar and Marvin and Trillian uh, escaping and running out of the auditorium, similar to here, and then you would see a film of them in the bar, again, <laughs> stopping for a drink, then going into the car park, hijacking a car, and then you'd go back on stage and you would find them sitting in a small Mini. I think it was a Mini, or was it a Fiat 500? And then that... And then we blew that apart with an inflatable, which was, became the Bob Butterbeast of Troll. I mean, this was, at that time, that was, was, was incredibly innovative and, flu, and fluid and, and quite, I think, actually quite beautiful as well. As I was saying to you, one of the things I want to say is that I find some of the writing and, and listening to the first series was a very beautiful thing. It, it is extremely funny, but also there's an aesthetic to it that, is, that is, is quite gorgeous and very surprising. When you didn't know the gags, when you didn't know what the answer to the, you know, the question was, it was really, you, know, you tuned in every week to hear what was going on and that, you know that. And your Marvin was our other guest, David Lerner. <laughs> So this is long before you were trapped inside the tin can on television. Yeah. This is Marvin at the very... Did you heard the radio version? No, hadn't heard the radio version. Uh, and it was only during... I think it was after we had started touring uh, from North Wales, uh, Bangor, that sort of area, that I <laughs> heard it for the first time. <laughs> and I didn't, I didn't know what to do for the voice or anything like that. But Alan Bennett had just been on the radio doing Eeyore. Oh, yes. <laughs> That was, and that was it. I thought, oh, well, this is fine. I mean, I don't know who this Stephen Moore is. And I hadn't heard it. And then I, <laughs> Stephen, during, uh, you know, as I say, and I go, oh, he's quite good. <laughs> <laughs> and what I couldn't have known, what we couldn't have known, uh, because I, I, I really should say here that I wouldn't be here if it weren't for this man on my left, Jonathan Petherbridge. It was Peth's brilliance, his imagination, his zest. <laughs> his ability to take six times <laughs> half hour radio scripts and take them, uh, turn them into a show. I was, 
I was doing the music at the time. I was writing the music for Ali Barbar and the Forty Thieves. I wrote the music. And um, it was good. And, uh, and such was the budget that we, we only had two thieves, didn't we? Ali Barbar and the two thieves. <laughs> but, but I remember very, very well uh, being at the piano and writing this crap music, this awful music. And uh, he, he came in with these six half-hour scripts and said, we're doing The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And I'm going, what? The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? And he said, you're playing Arthur Dent or, or, or Marvin. And I, uh, uh, I don't know. I didn't know who either of them were. And uh, eventually he would say, oh, Mike wants to play uh, Arthur Dent, so you're playing Marvin. <laughs> and we, we did the... We did the read-through, 1979, this was Christmas, 1979, and Sue Elliott, who played Trillian, we did, we did in, in the, 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 the theatre clue at Green Room, and um, I, I said that first line, I think you ought to know I'm feeling very depressed, and Sue went, hooray! <laughs> Great crowd. <laughs> you know, I had no idea what, what, I, what I had just said. When we came to play Banger, the, the, the theatre erupted, and I, I think I would know, what? and I literally looked round to see who else had come on, because I thought that something was funny was happening, and had no idea that what I had said would still be talked about 42 years later. That's where we are. Very good. Well, uh, it's quite right. Stephen Moore had exactly the same response, or rather the audience responded the same way, to that line, his very first line, I think you ought to know, um, at the 2008 um, 30th anniversary performance of episode two at the Royal, Ge Royal Geographical Society. Um, and he hadn't realised, and I, we, we do have a video of it, but I don't think we got it today, unfortunately, but it was... Um, his smile just grew when he realised yeah. that one line yeah. lit up the room. Yeah. Everybody loves Marvin. Yeah. It, is, it, it is extraordinary. You're going to have to do it later, obviously. <laughs> um, because we're doing the episode two again. We are doing episode yeah. two again. It's a good one because it's yeah. got everybody in it. And... Yeah. But, no, I mean, Peth is the man. And, 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 and as a result of that, Alan J.W. Bell came to see the Theatre Cluid production. The, the BBC were, were scouting around. Yeah. And I was eventually asked to audition for the TV. But that's the TV. We'll, we'll get on to the rainbow yeah. in, the, in a moment. But, um, Jonathan, you got any memories of those earliest shows? Any actual things in the performance that the, still um, stay with you? The Theatre Car Park at Bangor, where we opened... Uh, we divided the, the, it into three parts, so you had to come over three evenings initially. And our designer, Paul Condras, was very ambitious. And in the, in the car park after the third night, you saw most of the set. Most of the set had been ditched. Oh. We actually, he completely over-designed everything. And I just remember going, are we going to take this back to Clue, or are we just going to leave it? It was before recycling, I'm afraid. <laughs> and uh, we, left, we, we left most of, the, most of the set there and went down to a very, very sort of minimalist set. I mean, it was really minimal. Do you remember there was no curtain call? Oh, my God, yes, there was. I, I, just I, blowing leaves. Yes, yes. And, and, and we left them wanting more. Well, <laughs> the auditorium was empty at that point. <laughs> That's true as well. And I also remember, do you also remember the, uh, when, we, when we turned to Cardiff, the, the party who came, there was, a, there was a, like a coach party who came, but they weren't wearing towels. They were all wearing black bin liners. And they sat in the back three rows and rustled quietly. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Well, that, that's my memory. Until I saw these photos again, my memory of the ICA was that all the sets were very sort of cardboard, tin foil, you know, black bin bags. It was, it was punk, you know, that time. There is a punk-style poster for the ICA version. I tried to find it today. I, can't, I think it must be in my loft. But it's... It wasn't punk in North Wales. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's quite that work. I, I, I do remember, I mean, I saw full credit for getting on at Cluid, but I do remember sort of Douglas saying that um, to Ken, hear the scripts, I don't think it will make a play. Uh, get, get on with it. And then Ken said, oh, I think it will. I think you had to cut it down. The ICA version yes. was, was a sort of more um, but it, but compact it, version. But we could yeah. do whatever we wanted with the radio script. So yeah. yeah. And I think the reason the radio scripts work on stage was because all you needed was imagination. Yeah. 
Uh, and a know, towel. And a towel. <laughs> <laughs> and the ICA did depend on that. It yeah. was minimal sets. Yeah. And uh, another thing that I, I remember was um, the mice. How are you going to do the mice on stage? <laughs> well, there, w there were pictures. I don't know if it shows the forced perspective table that Ford and Arthur sat at. Do you remember? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, do you want to explain you, how you did it? Well, we just did it with, like, with little fingers, with our <laughs> fingers through the table. Like, uh, uh, as, as though, so you're talking to yourself. Well, what I remember is you made no pretense that these mice were going to appear by surprise. No. Because there was, you could see them putting the, <laughs> putting the glove on and then they'd pop up in the middle of the table. And you did the sort of ventriloquist thing right at the side of your mouth. <laughs> it was lovely because it just took the audience with them. You know, that's what I enjoyed. Now, I didn't get to see the Cluid version until you toured some months later. We're going to skip over the rainbow for a moment. You toured it again in, I think, late 81 well, or early I think it was. A, I think it was a year later. You disagree. I don't know. I remember 82 was Plymouth. I thought it was 81 because I just... I've got... probably got a document on my computer at home that says the actual date and I should have done my homework. Yeah, yeah, we, we sort of compressed it into one long evening. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, sorry, I'm sorry if anybody came, I really have. Um, <laughs> but I caught up with it at Pool, which is where I met you. Yeah. I'd, yeah, yeah, I'd yeah. got a video camera and <laughs> shot some little interviews with you <laughs> and Roger Blake, who was yeah. the book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And um, Lewis Cohen. Yeah. 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 Well, Roger was the book at the Rainbow as well. He was. Yeah. 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 Town, very good. Why do you remember the Towngate Theatre? Well, why did you come to the Towngate Theatre? Uh, because my friend was uh, studying at Southampton University. Right. And we took a little car trip down to yeah. come and see the show. Because my, abide, my abiding memory of, of playing the Towngate Theatre pool was that there was an NCP car park. <laughs> and I had a little mini in those days. And, I, you know, you'd, you'd park, you'd, you'd take a ticket from the bloke. And you'd go, morning, morning, morning. And you'd leave. And, of course, you wouldn't pay because you were there all day. So you didn't have to pay. And, I, you know, and eventually on the Thursday morning, John, who was playing forward, he was just in the car in front of me. And he was parking at the same time. And this guy came, and it was this really argy-bargy going on. And I said to John, I said, what, what was the problem? He said, oh, he, oh, he came to see the show last night. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah, and he said, you were bloody awful. <laughs> and then he let me through. <laughs> I'd arrived. Ah, oh, tough audience in Paul, obviously. Well, let's step back then slightly from that, that 82 tour. 1980, the summer of 1980. Now, I spent the first part of 1980, working um, at the animation company, Peer Studios, on the pilot episode of the TV version. So I was a young animator. and then, 12. <laughs> you're very young. I was 18. I was 19 that summer. And I, I, um, I went to the pub where all the science fiction fans meet in London, or used to meet, the One Ton Pub at Saffron Hill. Oh, yeah, that's me. <laughs> um, and um, a, a guy came round. I was handing out flyers to come and see uh, a first screening of the TV pilot because the, the management at BBC didn't know whether it was funny or not, so <laughs> they had to record a laughter track at the NFT. They knew it was expensive, but yeah, not necessarily. They, yeah, funny. they were worried. They were going to put a laughter track on, and Alan Bell was fighting that desperately. Not we didn't want that. Anyway, that was going to be recorded, so I was handing out flyers for that, and this other chap came along handing out flyers for a stage show of Hitchhikers that, until then, nobody knew about. And it was only two weeks away. This typical Ken, isn't it? And this was John Joyce, the actor, yeah. great mate of Ken's. He was handing out those flyers. I was handing out the other ones. That's, that's the, that's the programme booklet cover. Price 50p, look at that. Um, so, he was looking for people to volunteer to come and make props and masks. So my friends and I all volunteered, and I started sculpting Vogue on masks. And I think I took a mould off your face or something. Yeah, it didn't look like you in that picture. But <laughs> um, they definitely covered with my face with glossed eyes of the TV Yeah. I don't remember 
I don't know. I think, I think it was more, I think it was more primitive. Yeah, it was. It was. It was almost like a rubber rain hat that you pulled on with <laughs> elastic chin, chin strap or something. But your costume was inflatable. Was yeah, it was. It was, uh, it, it was basically a series of balloons outside my body. They were still putting it together and gluing it together when I went on on the first night. It tells you something about the Rainbow Theatre. What I did like was they had this uh, sort of big curved... Yeah, yeah, and Ken insisted that I do the, the, the obvious rude gesture with, 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 with my... Blurgle crunger. Or whatever it was, yeah, in the poem. <laughs> or I'll shall rend, shall rend thee. Rend thee. <laughs> yeah, that one, yeah. And they both I th I thought it was a little... wobbled their yeah, Blurgle crunger. Yeah. I'm not proud of having been an actor. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that... Um... I think that was the first time I met you. Yeah, well, I, I, it wasn't a shoe-in that I got Marvin at all. Uh, and indeed, it was you probably who was instrumental in ensuring... Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 in ensuring that Douglas knew ah. that I wanted to do the telly. Yeah. Uh, right. But, Alan, Alan Bell came to see the Rainbow Stage yeah. show. Yeah. But he left <laughs> at the uh, at when it interval. <laughs> he left at the interval, apparently. But he did note you and Mike. So that okay. led to you guys being in the TV version. But to get the but to get the stage role at the Rainbow, I had to go to the, the Leg of Mutton. Was it Haverstock Hill? Was that the pub? It was Ken's pub? Daisy can probably tell me that. Load uh, of hay. Load, load, load of hay. hay. That's right. Because my girlfriend at the time, Annie, said the only way you're going to get is to go to his local pub. So I did. <laughs> so I went. So I went to the pub, and I said, "Hello, I'm David." And he said, yeah. and, I, and, uh, <laughs> and I said, "I played Mar." Marvin, it, it's theatre good. Well, you know, so it was that conversation. It was really quite embarrassing. And I think we had some drink. And what happened was, he said, well, it's like a school play, David. Right, OK. And that was it. I got in touch with him, not at all, afterwards, and thought, because it was only a five-minute meeting and several pints, um, that the world was going to end and that I hadn't got the job. But blow me, I had. Yeah, it'll do. So I did. <laughs> so I did it at the Rainbow. Well, my yeah. friend um, Susan Moore, who went on to make Doctor Who monsters and things like that, and um, Jonathan Savile, and we, we, were, we took over one of the dressing rooms at the Rainbow, and we wrote on the door, Rubber Room, because <laughs> we were making, like, alien fruit for Millieways and various masks and things, and people would pop their head round the door, and then looked a bit disappointed. I think they <laughs> something a bit more exciting. And um, one day, Ken appeared, and um, he had this piece of paper, which was a new page of script. Now, this is like three days, I think, before the show's about to happen. So this was a last sort of minute addition by um, Douglas Adams, and it was the dish of the day. And it hadn't been done before. And he came in, and he says, um, Oh, a big dairy animal. You can do a cow. <laughs> I said, I haven't got enough clay left to do a cow. There's no, no time to go and get it. It was, also, it was quite late in the evening. They wanted it for the rehearsal the next day. I can't remember who played the dish. Who well, was it? it was Mike. Oh, Mike? So, it was a good mouse. I, I said, I've got, I've, got, um, I've got enough clay to do a pig. <laughs> so he said, well, I'll do. <laughs> so I made a pig overnight. Yeah. And I, I remember laying... It, up on the, at the rainbows, it was a huge place. Well, it's, it's a church now. A massive, massive place. 3,000 plus seater. And I sat in the balcony at 3 a.m. while the guys from LA were practicing the lasers. <laughs> so I was a bit spaced out and tired anyway, because it had been like long nighters. And the laser was going all over the ceiling, which was dotted with lights like stars. And, uh, and that's an enduring memory I had of that. The next day, Ken comes in again. I want a Vogon bum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what? Is it, and there was, uh, in the Dentrassy bit, there's a hatch in the scenery, and this green rubbery bum pokes through and shits all over the washing. <laughs> Dentrassy had their laundry hanging up. And it, nobody knew what it was, because it looked like a monster or something. But it, anyway, Jonathan Savile made it overnight again. I can't think why I've forgotten. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, I operated props for a few performances, <laughs> and we had to, a big Coke bottle full of, I don't know, some mixed up crap that we fired through this bogon. But it had like a distended anus <laughs> coming out from between two big green sheets. You brought it all back. Yeah, well, um, but I, and I do remember Mike being uh, stitched into it because I was being welded with yeah. a, 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 a soldering gun uh, a, a, as we went on. But you were all silver. You were completely we were, silver, weren't you? Yeah. Skin yeah. and everything. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and what happened was, in like t t 10, 20 minutes in, new f scenery arrived, didn't it, <laughs> on the first night. The first night it was always the most horrendous, well, not the most horrendous, that was the, doing children's theatre, but <laughs> second, <laughs> second most horrendous thing. We, yes. we were doing the entire length of yes. the first series um, as, as our script. Nothing had been cut. Nothing added, nothing and, taken and, out. And, and, and things, as I say, technically speaking, we were running the second half of the show without having had a tech run through. And in the second half of the show, those lasers represented the destruction of the universe. So we did the, the destruction of the universe without technical rehearsal. <laughs> and it got to the middle bit, and <coughs> somebody had hired this, this rock group to be the band at Millieways during the interval. They were only supposed to be on for 15 minutes. 25, 30 minutes really? of, their, of their gig. Well, were, you, you were obviously far too busy trying to remember what you had to do. Well, yeah, what, what, but, how what time did we get out of the theatre then? Gone, gone, gone 11.30, I think. <laughs> but the, the thing was, because it was at Finsbury Park in those days, the tubes didn't run that late. <laughs> and about halfway through the second act, people started looking at their watches <laughs> and getting up and going home. <laughs> and which is sad, because they, all, they, they had filled the theatre and they all knew the script better than we did and chanted it along at us but, uh, uh, but and then the next day they cut the, the cut the script and but that was what it was reviewed on and that was why what was the the the, the review oh uh, mr mr adams has charted his uh, travelers into a black hole was the the best review i think we got <laughs> And, and uh, I mean, we never filled the theatre after that. And no, we, it, it, was, it was due to run eight weeks. I think it says <coughs> it right there, but... Um, well, it says limited yeah. season. But um, it ran four weeks. That long, oh, God. Now, with a 3,000-plus auditorium outside of the West End... Yeah, it had 3,000-plus. It, 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 it had, dwindled, it had, it? had about, about two men and a dog. In it by the by the time it closed down, there was there was money. Obviously, there was money coming from somewhere, but it wasn't always going to the actors. No idea. <laughs> yeah, not going to the actors. There was, uh, there was there was there was a bit of substance done backstage. There was, uh, it, was, there was it was that kind of show. It was, somebody said to me, "This is lo show is losing a lot of street cred because it's a coke." production rather than a, a dope production. <laughs> I know at least one distinguished member of the cast was on nitrous oxide. Um, I don't Where know. Where was I? Are you aware we have libel laws in this country? <laughs> there, was, um, there was an old coach parked at the back of the theatre in the, in the side road at the back and um, it was run by some hippies and um, we were all working there long hours, you know, getting things ready, making props. And they said, I'm starving. And they said, oh, there's this coach out of the back. They do great veggie burgers. <laughs> veggie. <laughs> so I went, <laughs> I went out there and I, I went in and I sort of said, um, I ordered a couple of these burgers, which were fab. <laughs> and I said, um, have you got any Coke? And they went, oh, yeah, yeah. I said, oh, great, I'm so thirsty. They went, oh, no, you'll have to go out to the newsagent. <laughs> Straight faced. <laughs> one, it's only one of my favourites. The, the Evening Standard sent along a bloke called David Johnston uh, to interview me. He tried to chat me up uh, rather unsuccessfully when he put his hand on my crutch. Wow. Um, but it, that was that was fine. But he, he uh, and he took me to the comedy st the store. It's just opened then, and all that sort of. Thing. Anyway, he got this interview, and uh, it ran in the in the daily in the in the Ely Stand. They had that sort of you know what I like, what I want to do, my favourite things are. <laughs> and, and that started with this quote: "What what would you prefer to be doing now if you weren't doing this?" And I said something like, "Oh, on a on a horse with Francesca Annis." <laughs> I, well, I don't know, uh, but, uh, and, and I, was, I was reading this and, and 
the, 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 the evening standard, the evening standard got passed on. Douglas came in, he picked it up, and he, he picked up. Oh, there's a bit about you in here. I said, oh yeah, yeah, I, like I didn't know. Oh yeah, what's it say? <laughs> said about this, this Francesca Ennis. Oh right. Oh. Do, 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 do I come over well? He's, no, you come over like a wanker. <laughs> okay. I was, going, I was going to ask each member of the panel if they have any personal memories of Douglas. Did you deal with him on any kind of basis on these projects? Well, he let me sleep on his sofa for a week during the, <laughs> the rainbow, so uh, I, I did not learn a lot, lot of him about him, except he does keep, did keep guitars around. <laughs> Well, yeah, he lived round the corner from me uh, in Kingsdown Road in North Islington for a while, and uh, his, uh, he was constantly awoken because somebody in the vicinity had a cockerel, so that was also uh, disturbing his writing. And, of course, you got hired then, around the time of this show, to record for the LP, the vinyl LP record of Hitchhiker. Yeah, it was a surprise. But <laughs> towards the end, they asked me to uh, record all the female voices on, um, on both of the albums. So you played Trillium? Yeah, it was great. Can you remember anything about those recording sessions? I remember I left the iron on. I thought I'd left the iron on. <laughs> <laughs> These are the important things. <laughs> An actor's nerves. So Stephen Moore kindly came all the way back with me to find that the iron, of course, had been turned off. Um, but it was, yeah, it was done in quite a hurry. Yeah, we had to, you know, had to get on, get a move on. Uh, Richard, did um, you deal with yeah, Douglas at all? Did yeah, you? no. Yeah. Uh, he just, unlike I did, admired Ken's danger, <laughs> and um, so he wanted anything that was daring or dangerous. Douglas gave a thumbs up to it, and so that, that was our sort of. Uh, mantra for the uh, evening, really. Many, many years later, you also shared something else with Stephen Moore, who played Marvin. <laughs> we, um, you were both, both dressed in green, as yeah, I remember. Yeah, we played Silurians in various Doctor Who episodes, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, so we sort of reminisced and chatted to each other. But he, <laughs> he was always moaning, but because his makeup took a bit longer than mine, because he had to have hands done as well. Silurian hands. I managed to get away with that, and I was wear wearing gloves. Yeah. So, and you also had a mask. I had a mask. Very right, fashionable right. nowadays. <laughs> yeah, no, well, it's brilliant makeup by Millennium X. I mean, who still do it? But I mean, yeah. So, it's, but uh, I do miss Stephen a lot. Yeah. So, yeah. We we have a little video later today that uh, as a tribute to Stephen. Now, what have we got here? Pictures from the Rainbow. That's Lewis Cohen in the Star Trek shirt. <laughs> David Brett playing Ford in the stripy red and white. Now, he got famous a bit later on because he was a member of... Do, 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 do. Very good. Do, 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 do. Flying Pickets, yeah. The Flying Pickets, that's it. Yeah. We went blank for a moment there. So what am I singing? Um, oh. Roger. No, yeah, Roger. That's Roger in the pod. Now, that pod was really high above the stage and he got lowered down from this immense proscenium arch which has this kind of Italianate village all built all around the sides. Her name was Beverly, was it? Beverly, Beverly. Yes, in there. She was in Flash Gordon as well, I spotted. Was she married to a vicar? I've no idea. <laughs> no, but I'll tell you what. Yeah, she and Roger spent quite a bit of time in that pod. They did? Yeah, in the shadows before they had to be lowered down for him to do the next bit of up. the book. Yeah. That's the bar scene. Wow. Who have we got there? I can't recognise them all. Uh, no idea. <laughs> that was to one side of the stage. Dave. Dave was the barman. I can't remember Dave's surname. F it was Mitch actually... on the end. That's Mitch on the extreme Mitch on the end. right. Yeah, yeah, Mitch, is it? Yeah. 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 Wow. Oh, there you go. There's more detail in the programme booklet. Okay. Beverly Andrews. There you go. Beverly Andrews. Yeah. Lewis Cowan, I thought, was very good. Yeah. He made me. He played loads of parts. Like, Mike, you, you had 12 parts, I think. Oh, Some of them were just voices from the wings. Dear me. I, the, the disaster was, 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 was Marvin. Yeah. No, not Marvin, no, I'm oh. sorry. Deep <laughs> Thought. <laughs> no, 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 of the parts that I played, the disaster was Deep Thought, which is odd because it's how I got the job. 
I, I, I was a young and innocent, comparatively young, comparatively innocent actor, and I didn't know anything about Ken Campbell. And I didn't know how absolutely bonkers it was that he had been given the chance to be the director at uh, Liverpool. And let's, it was fairly bonkers. So I went to, I wrote him a letter saying, Would you, would, I, you're, casting the, um, <coughs> you're casting the season, could I come up and audition? And I, I thought this was going to be a normal audition. I was wrong. I got in there and he said, Right, what part can you play in The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? And I went, uh, a deep thought. Ooh, he said, I think that's interesting. I'd never thought of having you on stage before. Oh, I haven't either. <laughs> I just sat there, but eventually, well, I did it fairly straight to start with in the rehearsals. And then he came up to me and he said, Michael, deep thought. You're being boring. <laughs> <laughs> Which is the sort of note that an actor really treasures. <laughs> and, um, and, he, uh, and he had me do it in an Arthur Mullard voice. I, I honestly can't say it was my finest hour. The rest was all right. Um, let's see now. Uh, yeah, the, the, pr uh, the prosthetic Vogon jelts and various voices and, and a mouse. We did the mice. On stage um, with, with big mice heads um, off to one side, as if we were we were being blown up from our natural size. Very <laughs> odd, and, and mostly nude as the captain of the Archie B. <laughs> oh, the glory of my career. <laughs> well, we do. There's somebody missing from this panel today. Terry Johnson was going to be here. Now he did a fantastic play called Ken which I saw in 2016. I gather it's been done in a few places. Um, all about Ken Campbell. And um, we're very lucky to have in the audience today Ken Campbell's daughter, Daisy, who I'd like to welcome to the stage. <laughs> what we have, we have um, an excerpt from Terry's piece about the Rainbow stage show. Do you want to stand forward? And it's all a, yes. Yeah, we haven't rehearsed in true Campbellian style, of course. And if I'd had a pen, I'd have cut some lines, but uh, I didn't. So. The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy had been an enormous and celebrated success on the radio. An enterprising chap called Richard Dunkley decided it deserved a wider audience. Dunkley thought anything could be achieved with a roll of gaffer tape yeah. and a strong joint. <laughs> His instinct as a producer, if something were possible, would be aim w way beyond that for something almost certainly impossible. This was the spirit that impressed Ken and saw Dunkley march into the Rainbow Theatre in Finsbury Park and hire it. The logic behind this was impeccable. The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy was a romp through space and time, hitherto confined to a tiny stage at the ICA. Conversely, the Rainbow Theatre was the biggest auditorium in Greater London, thus more closely resembling the universe. <laughs> I should have smelled a rat. There were two weeks into rehearsal when Ken called me. I should have sensed the way the wind was blowing. John Joyce wasn't going to be in it. With the wind in that direction, I should have smelled that rat. Ken liked things to be free, in every sense of the word. <laughs> Not because he was mean-spirited, but because he had an increasing body of work behind him that was, at its best, when produced in penury. It's money that fucks it up. <laughs> you have to account for it. Every time you spend something, you owe someone else a fee for something else. And people start moaning. If he's got a wig, why can't I have a bus fare? <laughs> as soon as you put money into the equation, then there's not enough of it. It's like being there, I have to say. <laughs> I lived it, baby. <laughs> Very good. Sir. For Hitchhiker, Dunkley had raised a shitload of money. The Russian gangsters looking for UK investment thought they were getting a rock gig. It was obvious as soon as I entered the desultory church hall that the show was in trouble. Ken's A-team had deserted him for the National Theatre and the telly. Around the edges of the room were a group of aspirant souls who, 
with a couple of honourable exceptions, were well out of their depth. I want you to play Zaphod Beeblebrox. It'll suit you. He thinks he's the hero, but he's not. <laughs> Thanks. Well, in fact, I want you to play one half of Zaphod Beeblebrox. This is Doug. He's playing the other half. A dour Canadian nodded at me, dourly. Doug's used to being at the front, so you'll have to go at the back and put your head over his shoulder. A Zaphod Beeblebrox had two heads. We haven't got the two-footed two -footed boots yet, but when we do, it'll be much easier to walk. It wasn't. <laughs> Terry, is it? Oh, hi, Doug. How's it going? You're my third other head so far. <laughs> Said Doug's head. It wasn't an easy part to play, and Doug was at the front. He got all the best lines. Ken and Richard had gone all out and hired a very illustrious designer who had gone all out and designed a transforming sculpture of a set to fill the enormous rainbow stage. It's complete rubbish. And we can't afford it, which is an advantage, because it's complete rubbish. <laughs> so Dudley set about designing it himself. There was a scene on the moon. He des I don't remember that. He designed a long crescent-shaped bit of scenery that lay across the four states from wing to wing. R Richard, what is that? Uh, well, I thought the moon should be made of cheese, so that's the rind. I don't think it reads. Well, it's not painted yet. It's going to say Edam on the side. <laughs> He, de he designed a spaceship cockpit with flushing controls and a ramp leading up to it. This was Zaphod's domain. Zaphod was being played by two men in one pair of boots. We never once made it up there. <laughs> there were lasers that bounced off tiny mirrors in the auditorium and formed a geometric representation of the prow of a spaceship. Another ladder was Laser. rigged. That's a type I... Another leader. Oh, getting quite right. <laughs> that ladder was rigged to create a cone of light pointing down at the apron through a cloud of stage haze. Right, Ford and Arthur stand on the apron. When that laser goes off, I want you to jump. Jump? Yes, jump. Jump where? Into the orchestra pit. The what? It's in front of you. Just step off. Ha! Ha! Have you seen the drop? Ken, it's about ten feet. Yeah, well, that's why those mattresses are there. Are you men or mice? Jump! The lights went out. They jumped. Jesus! Boing! Christ! Ow! Lights up! Sure enough, Ford and Arthur were nowhere to be seen. Ken was ecstatic. Yeah, fantastic! Yeah, that's a first-class example of great theatre craft. The ingenious juxtaposition of a 3,000-watt diode laser and an old mattress. <laughs> Any year now, they'll be doing it like this at the National. <laughs> On the opening night, nigh on 3,000 people turned up. All of them overweight men between the ages of 17... <laughs> ...and 34. Far out in the uncharted backwaters of the unfashionable end of the western spiral arm of the galaxy lies a small, unregarded yellow sun. 3,000 people raised the roof. The curtain had risen at 7.30. By ten past eight, we had run out of scenery. <laughs> the lasers were switched on. But the circle was cantilevered, designed to shift a couple of inches when full. This it had done and shifted the mirrors with it. The lasers failed to create anything resembling a spaceship. But they did shoot out a random matrix of green, meany laser beams bouncing off handrails and chandeliers, potentially blinding anybody daft enough to look at it. 
It was an audience of sci-fi enthusiasts. Most of them risked it. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> oh boy, that was good. Thank you for that, Daisy. Um, one thing I remember about, I mean, health and safety wasn't in it. That's, that's <laughs> the, the laser beams went everywhere. Did anyone else want water? Yeah, yeah you want one, yeah. Um, what I remember was they had a huge inflatable whale, which was incredibly heavy. I mean, it was massive. Uh, uh, what's my one? Sorry, it was, you know, ger germs and everything, you know. Nowadays, we're all being... Backstage, everyone was sort of touching elbows and all that kind of nonsense. Um, but anyway, there we go. Anybody else? Uh, anyway, this whale... <laughs> This whale was, um, I mean, it was enormously long. It was like almost the size of a, like a single-decker bus. And um, it lay in a sort of rather deflated state up on the circle. And the idea was they were going to drop it <laughs> off the circle at the given moment in the story. The whale would descend and bounce off the heads <laughs> of the people in the stalls. <laughs> And I went up into the circle and looked at this thing, and, I thought, and it was thick, heavy rubber. And it would take some industrial pump to fill it up and inflate it and that. And they decided that they're against it, because it would have probably broken several people's necks <laughs> if it had landed on them. Um, like channeling Pink Floyd here. Well, something like that. In the, in the end, I think they had a much smaller inflatable they dropped on the stage. But this thing was enormous, and so they decided, well, they couldn't waste it. They would got it from somewhere, Greenpeace or something. They, they put it on a truck, and they took it down to Tower Bridge and threw it off. <laughs> The river police were not happy, but it was, a, it was a good publicity stunt. I mean, the rainbow is now legendary as being the disaster of hitchhikers, which, you know, uh, I can understand. I, I'm fond of it because it was the first sort of stage thing I'd ever worked on. Um, but, you know, like, you can't deny that it was... Uh, it was definitely Jonathan's version, uh, Cluid, that sort of had time to get it together and it toured and it did it properly. And there hasn't, I mean, there's been lots of different stage versions since, with not many professional ones. I'm not sure that it's even possible now, is it? No, it's a, not because Disney have it all wrapped up. Mm -hmm. and so that, the, there is the, the radio uh, live tour that in 2012 and 2013. They also did it on radio. And, but that was kind of a reading, which is what we're going to have later this afternoon, a reading of episode two. Um, but anyway, fond memories. Um, I don't know if we've got enough time. There's a three-minute clip of the rainbow um, with subtitles because the sound's not brilliant. It was just shot on video at the back of the stalls. So if the tech team are ready, the owl got the thumbs up there, we can have a three-minute clip of the rainbow. Just over three minutes. Fine, is there somewhere we can talk? Well, we've got to talk. Fine, talk and drink. It's vitally important that we talk and drink. Look, what's the matter with you, Paul? That man wants to on my house then. Well, he can do it while you're away, can't he? But I don't want him to. Ah, then what is the matter with you? Listen, Arthur, I've got to tell you the most important thing you've ever heard in your life. And I've got to tell you now, in the saloon bar of the Dog and Duck. Why? Because you're going to need a very stiff drink. So, so what you're saying is that I write poetry because underneath my mean callous heartless exterior, I really just want to be loved. Is that it? Well, I mean, don't we all deep down? No. The boy, though, I just want to purchase just where my mean callous heartless exterior is a sharp relief. I'm going to throw you off the ship anyway. Large <laughs> oh, ejector. I've been ordered to take you up to the bridge. Here I am, framed inside the ladder, and they tell me to take you up. <laughs> Call that job satisfaction. Because <laughs> I don't. Good God, it's home! Trisha McMillan! What are you doing here? Same as you. 
thought at the front of the show, yes. <laughs> yeah, I was just asking backstage about that. Um, the, the, um, the deep thought sequence has always been quite a long stretch, of very yeah. similar, isn't it? It's quite heavy going. So um, that was a great idea, to put the first half of deep thought right at the very beginning. Yeah. And there are other shows that have done that, I think, since. I need to get the scripts out again, because the, the, how they change and how they evolved, I think, are probably, it's possibly quite interesting. You asked earlier about Douglas, meeting, meeting Douglas, and um, mm. I met him a few times, and I was so arrogant. I was suggesting, I was, I was sort of saying to him what was wrong with his radio series. I <laughs> <laughs> it's a cut and short. I mean, absolutely stupid. He didn't, I don't, I'm not sure what he thought about theatre, quite honestly. Um, he sort of, uh, with, our, with our version, he sort of went, OK, do it if you must. If you must do it like that, do it like that. And then he came to see it, he quite enjoyed it. Oh, yeah, he was in awe. He really was in awe. But that's not what he said to me, <laughs> <laughs> That's not the note I got. Yeah. And the other, and, and also to Ken as well. I mean, when I, when, when I went to see Ken at, when, at, at Liverpool, and I had a long conversation with him about doing, doing us both having done it, and the conversation was actually quite a serious conversation about the divergence of the literatures. <laughs> the, uh, the idea that science fiction is a very, very serious um, form uh, that in a way has been slightly mar was marginalised around the sort of 40s, 50s and has never really properly been taken seriously, even you know, despite Arthur C. Clarke and Vonnegut, people like that. And, and I remember that. And, that, and that, that, that thought has always been quite important to me. What he actually said was that if you think about it, all literature is just people coming in and out of doors. Whereas <laughs> <laughs> well, science fiction is everything else. <laughs> gentlemen I've really enjoyed this yeah. reminiscence of all the different early stage versions of Hitchhiker please thank our panel Toby Longworth. Thank you. Thank 
Okay, then we're going to have a 15 minute break. So you've got time to uh, change ends, have some oranges, do whatever you do in those 15 minutes. Uh, if that's yes, this is going to be some. Yeah, you will be. Asked. There is a break. We do need to win, but there are some radio bits during that time. But don't try and do both at the same time, because it will end in tears. <laughs>